Welcome back, everybody. This is the hardest slot of the day. Just had a nice lunch, glass of wine. You've been listening to talks the whole morning, and now it's time to have your nap, right? So I feel the same, but I have to talk and I have to stay awake. So I'll try to keep you entertained about entity authentication and symmetric key establishment. So this morning, um, we explained um, what the role is of entity authentication. I'll come back to it. And so I also explained this morning that cryptography is about moving problems to keys. And so this afternoon, we'll speak mostly about how to establish secret keys between parties. Um, tomorrow, there will be a lecture where we explain how to establish public keys, which sounds like a much easier problem. But in fact, we'll discuss it much longer because it's uh, where the rubber meets the road. This is where the hard problems really appear. So I want to explain to you what the goals are of entity authentication. I want to discuss passwords and their strengths and limitations. And you may know that some famous visionaries um, in the computer industry have said many times that passwords will disappear. But every time I look, I have more passwords. So we'll try to look at this and see what we can do about this. Um, then we look at the problem with authentication in practice. Um, it's a problem that seems very simple, but once you deploy it, it's actually very hard. And then we'll have also some time to look at key establishment protocols. So most of you, I think, were here this morning when I explained all this. In any case, I'm not going to go through it. I just want to explain that we are now in this case. We want to discuss authentication of entities, which cryptographers call identification. Um, but again, computer security people, they say identification is claiming an identity, and authentication is proving an identity. So we have a completely different use of terminology. But so for this afternoon, you'll have to do with my terminology as cryptographer. I will use the term identification, or to avoid any ambiguity, I will use the term MS authentication. Okay? So what is it? The problem, then we'll discuss passwords, schemes based on MAC algorithms, so a symmetric key, schemes based on public key, um, including challenge response and zero knowledge protocols, and then we look at biometrics. Because biometrics is always advertised as the next solution. As you know, it keeps being used everywhere, so we'll look at the strengths and limitations. But essentially, we deal with this problem. You have Eve who's talking to Bob. He says, hi, I'm Alice. And so the question for Bob is, how can you check whether it's Eve or Alice? This is an essential problem. Of course, we faced with this also in the physical world when you enter a bank and you want to withdraw money at, from the cashier or when you cross a border. But of course, these problems also happen in the online world when you want to log into your bank and transfer money or you want to log into a web server and get service or log into your company and look at company data. So the question is, why should Bob believe this is really Alice? And so we start with the definition of indication from the Handbook of Applied Cryptography, a textbook where you can find the references in my slides of this morning. And this handbook dates back to 97. So it's not completely up to date, but it's still a very good book. And it's available online for free. So it's, um, of course, more than 900 pages. Um, and it's still a very useful reference to find definitions because those have not changed since um, 15 years ago. So this is a very long and boring definition. So what do we understand by empty authentication? When Bob, for example, is corroborated of the identity of another party, in this case Alice, and of the fact that this party is alive during the protocol. Okay? So in contrast to data authentication, data authentication, you MAC or sign a document, and you can do this today and send this document next week or next month or next year. You can still authenticate the document and link this to a certain key and a person. MT authentication is something about now. You want to, it's, it's about interactions. It's about crossing a border, withdrawing money, making a transfer. You want to actually now find out that this person is in the system is speaking to you. Okay? And this is a very big problem. As we'll see, passwords actually don't give you this property. Because a password, you can send it, you can type it now, but somebody can record it and send it out a year later. In fact, a password, according to this definition, 
does not provide you with empty authentication because it doesn't give you the liveness property. Okay? But we'll see protocols that do, and we still discuss uh, passwords with their limitations. So they do achieve something, but not what we would really would like to achieve. So if you look at traditional textbooks, they will say authentication is based on something you know, like your password or your PIN code, something you have, like your Mac Stripe card or a smart card for banking, and then something you are, like your biometric properties. This is a simplification because there is something beyond biometrics where you measure the behavior of somebody, like the typing pattern, the speed at which we type, or maybe how you assign a document. This is more dynamic is because, in my view, biometrics is something more static as a property of your, your body. Well, you have dynamic biometrics which uses the property of things you do, and there is actually the most fancy research is about your brain waves and trying to measure your brain waves a certain time. Okay, but there is also a fifth element, which is becoming more and more important, is where you are. And traditionally, this was done with dial back, with modems. This was mostly to reduce the cost that you would actually log into your company and dial up over a phone line. At that time, a phone call maybe still cost 10 cents a minute, so you had to have the company hang up and dial you back. And this was also believed to be authentication mechanism. It was very easy to spoof. You just had to produce a fake dial tone and not hang up. And the company was thinking to dial you back. In fact, they were not dialing back. The line stayed open and the attackers got in this way. But today, we all have smartphones with GPS. Um, companies like Google know exactly where every wireless access point is. So based on Wi-Fi data, based on GSM cell data, based on GPS, in fact, you can identify where people are. And Europe is launching the Galileo system. And the goal of Galileo is to have authenticated location so that you can actually not lie about where you are. Because it has been shown, um, I think, in the summer of 2012 by researchers in Texas that you can actually spoof GPS and make drones crash this way. And so this is a very important problem, authenticated location. And so if you look at authentication, I think that location information will become ever more important. So where somebody is and who is nearby may also be an element of authentication. And of course, you could add more. Like, of course, devices also get more and more. We have external devices, but of course, also our devices themselves may be authenticated as well. They have more and more cryptographic components in smartphones or in PCs. So passwords is very simple. So Alice chooses this super secure password, which nobody else can guess. And so Bob has a database with the username of Alice and all her passwords. And the password, OK? And so for all the users, you have this huge database. The system was invented in the late 60s, early 70s, when for the first time, computer systems could support more than one user. And so the system has many problems, which were not that important at the time. First, passwords can be guessed easily. Many people choose predictable passwords. Second. You can interrupt the channel and find out Alice's password. And you can actually send it later. You can capture the password and send it a month later or a year later. So in fact, the passwords do not have liveliness. You don't really know that this is the real user typing this password. It could be somebody who intercepted the password and sent it later. OK? There is a third problem. Bob knows your secret, which means that um, Bob, in principle, um, can impersonate you afterwards. This is a particular problem because we have many passwords, and most of us tend to reuse passwords. Right? We all have a few secure passwords, hopefully for banking, maybe for Gmail, or maybe for our work. And then we have those passwords which are used for, say, maybe Yahoo, or maybe for, for reading a newspaper, or for some other services. We, we keep using the same password. Okay? And so the problem is, uh, if Bob is malicious, in fact, he can set up a service which you like. He asks you to register, and now he has a username and password, and he can now go over the internet and try this combination everywhere. So this is not such a good property. And of course, also, we know that users are hacked, or servers are hacked. So if you hack into Bob's server, you actually find the password. And this happens regularly. OK, so passwords have actually many problems, and they don't achieve liveliness. So the last property is easy to fix. 
Um, it was invented in the 70s. Bob doesn't need to store the password. It, he can actually hash the password with a one-way function, and he can store the hash of the password. Okay? So if um, a year and a half ago, hackers broke into LinkedIn, and they found the password. They didn't find the password. They found the hash passwords. That meant that it was not possible to get your password. You had to actually do some search. So you try all possible passwords. You hash them with the hash function, and you see whether you get the hashed value. But at least it slows you down. So this at least gives a little bit of more security, because if you hack in, you still have to invert this one-way function by running to the password space. It's a small improvement. So what is the problem of passwords? It becomes obvious if you express passwords as keys. So what I did here is a very simple calculation. You compute how many bits of key you get from, for example, a lowercase password with, in this case, five digits is a 22-bit key. If you have lowercase and digits and you have 10 characters, you can have a 50-bit key. And if you would use a full keyboard, which is very difficult because if you do this and you choose Control S, then you hang up many connections. If you do Control X, you do some other stuff and so on. So it doesn't actually work, but assume it works. And you would use 10 characters. Well, mixed cases, all keyboard. First, you could never remember such a thing. But if you could, well, you still have only a 64-bit key. And I told you already this morning, 64-bit key is a joke. Yes? Is the calculation of number of bits per password, is this assuming all passwords of a certain length are... Equal? Yes, this is also assuming that people use a computer-generated password where every character is chosen as random. If you choose words from a dictionary, um, an average dictionary has a million words, that's a 20-bit password. If you do the changes like replacing an O by a zero and an, an, an L by an, an exclamation mark and the other trivial things, maybe you end up with 23, 24 bits. If you choose a dozen languages, if you choose movie stars, maybe you end up with 25 bits, 30 bits. bits of, real of real entropy, yes. Does, does measuring that digital count the dictionaries that are used by attackers? No. So there is still, you can also, there is large volumes of, no, this is if it's uniformly chosen across the dictionaries. There is large volumes of password lists. We say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven is the most popular, ABC, whatever, QWERTY, those things. If you use this, of course, then the entropy is even less. But it doesn't matter. So what I, the point I want to make with this slide is even an unusable, unmemorizable password is still only 64-bit key. And maybe with a passphrase, if you really do your best, maybe you can get to a 70-bit key. Maybe even an 80-bit key, but it would be really annoying. Okay. And you can't remember ever 20 of those. So in some sense, we seem lost. Well, there is a few more defenses. And so we can actually do better. And strange enough, this doesn't happen enough. So something you can do, there is, as Thomas points out, there is a list of most popular passwords. And so if you would use a popular password, the problem is, so your password is 1234567. Then in fact, the hash of this, anybody can compute this. And in fact, you will see that two users have used the same password. Also, the word password is a very popular password. If you hash this, you can actually find out who has this password as password. OK? So to make this attack a bit harder, and in fact, this attack comes down to what I explained this morning as time memory trade-off. To invert a one-way function, which has k bit of entropy, if you have to invert many of them, you can invert an individual one in 2 to the 2k over 3. So in fact, a 60-bit password is only a 40-bit password. And a 40-bit password is only a 2 thirds of 40, 27-bit password or something like this. OK, so it's actually even worse. So why is this? Because attackers can use a clever trick where they run to the whole password space, keep some special values from the iteration, and use those to later on recover your password faster. So the common name for this today is rainbow tables, but the real name should be time memory trade-offs. So this you can actually stop. You can stop this by giving everybody a different function. And this stops these attacks where you use rainbow tables or time memory trade-offs, or it also stops you from checking at once whether any of the 5,000 users has chosen password as a password. So how you do this, you give everybody a different function. It's called a salt. So you have a second parameter in the function, which is different for every user. And so you will actually store in the database the salt. So the salt itself is public, together with a hash of the password and the salt. 
Okay, so this way you don't improve security a lot, but you avoid parallel attacks. You avoid time memory trade-offs. And the only thing is to give every user a different parameter. It can be public. So a small effort can give you a lot more security with passwords. Okay, so this is explained here. So in fact, this was already implemented in the late uh, 70s in the Unix password function. At that time, the Unix password function was as follows. You use des, the plain text is all zeros. The password is used as the key, so it can be at most 56 bits. And then you encrypt, not once with des, but 25 times with des. And then you don't see the salt here, but the salt was 12 bits. And with this salt, certain bits in DES were swapped, so were modified, so that every user had a different variant of DES. And that was the ID. The problem, of course, is there is only 4,096 salts, but at that time, nobody could imagine that there would be more than 4,000 users of a system. And in fact, by the Bertie paradox, you can even show that if you have 60 users, two people will have the same salt. So today, you would want a salt of 64 bits or 128 bits, not 12 bits, but at least it helps a little bit. So why was this quite secure? Because in the 70s, computers were slow, and there was no fast code for DES. Today, we have many tricks to implement DES fast in software, because DES is a hardware-oriented algorithm, but there is many ideas to make it faster in software, which were not known at the time. And so doing this hashing took about a second in the late 70s. That meant that even if people had a weak password, running through the whole password space was slow. Okay. So this is why this 25 was chosen, so it would not take 40 milliseconds, it would take a full second. Okay? So if you would apply time memory trade-off techniques, what would it mean? Your pre-computation is something like this, so something like um, 60 bits of key. You would store per soul 2 terabyte, and you can find now a key in something like, I say, a few seconds on a PC. And this assumes that people use random desk keys as passwords. So in fact, if you use human passwords, which are easy to memorize, and which are 40-bit keys, then in fact, you can do this computation per salt. The storage per salt will be only a few gigabytes, and you will find the key back in milliseconds. These slides are very old. I made these slides 15 years ago, and I always said, some people will offer these services and will make money, and in fact, this has happened since then. So since, I think, six or seven years, there is companies who did these calculations, and they offer you to recover any key by using these techniques, using time memory trade-offs or rainbow table. So it looks pretty bleak because every 18 months, computers get faster by a factor of two. So we lose one bit of password every 18 months. On the other hand, our memories don't get better by a factor of two every 18 months. Right? They stay more or less constant. If you look at what people could remember 10 years ago or today, I don't think we're any better at remembering longer passwords. Well, you can get slightly better. I think you can get slightly better um, entropies. You can probably get 80 or 90 bits. But then, of course, you, they're still, if they're very long, they're harder to remember. If the phrases are long, they're harder to type. So it's not, I don't think it's a universal solution. It's okay if you need to, if you need to make, I think passphrases should be seen as a way to remember slightly larger passwords. But I don't think you can have a, pass, it's a password of 16 or 18 characters, which really would be like a, a very long key. Maybe you can have one of those for your ultra-paranoid application, but on average, it's not workable. The solution is actually somewhere else. The solution is, why don't we make this function a much slower? If we don't do 25 times this, but 25 million times this, then in fact, trying a password today will become slow again. Yes. It's a horribly bad idea for scale and performance, though. It's bad, for, it's bad for the server side. It means that the login takes one second of work for the server. So, I mean, for one off, I think that's a great idea. But when I'm handling, like, a transactional server for a video game or a messaging bus that's hit by a large corporation, that delay yes. turns into, like, it, it takes, when you delay it so it's actually going to stop the real world attacks today, I need about 10 concurrent runs of that password check to pin a high performance CPU. So now I need like, I need like a, a one, one high performance core for every 10 concurrent users logging in. For a, for a low scale system, that's no problem. But 
for a, you know, a large system, the, the hardware cost. Is yes, but it's, it's a trade-off for everybody. It's a very good point. It's a trade-off, right? So if you do a banking transaction, maybe you can afford the one second. If you want to have some game application or some instant gratification thing, you can still put it at 100 milliseconds rather than one microsecond, right? You can make the trade-off. So you can invest in security. You can make password hashing a bit slower. And more often, my last comment, I'll stop. My, my conjecture is for more high-performance password type verification. I like key, uh, a one-way key system like HMAX and such because I get the, I get the one-way benefit without, with, and I get yes. the, Yeah, so indeed you could make this function keyed, I agree. But then the question is, where do you store this key? And if the attacker gets a hold of the key, in fact, it doesn't help you at all, right? My answer to that is, Bart, stop me anytime, please. No, no, it's okay. But my answer to that is, well, more important than key management in that situation is isolation of that crypto. So if yes. I'm doing like a web server, I'm plugging in an HSM, and doing my H macking and grabbing the private key at the web server level, it's a total fail. The web server zone, the key is compromised, game over. But if I build a separate service and all it does is take a password and salt and spit out a hash, and I isolate that crypto to a separate service. That's a good trick, but you can also then put the hash value there. And then, in fact, it's much harder for attackers to get uh, hold of the hash passwords. And you also have some extra protection, right? I think it's, it could also be done without the key, but I agree that the key could help you. But I don't think it's a miracle solution either. But so there is now quite some standards and that actually look at this iteration and have this parameter x. And so you could actually decide yourself what your trade-off is, depending on the value of your application, depending on the speed. Uh, and of course, you need to increase x with Moore's law. So you can't, in fact, this is possible. You can always increase x and hash more without bothering the user. They don't never need to know that you increased x because they only give you the password. So there is a RSA standard called password-based de key derivation function. And then there is also S script and B script. And I know that um, Jean-Philippe Omasson has announced a competition for slow hashing to find better slow hash functions. Uh, because what is the main challenge is to avoid that people who have botnets or lots of CPUs can actually be faster than anybody else. And one of the tricks is to define memory bound functions that, have, that actually don't use the processor but actually use many memory accesses. And even on high end machines, especially main memory accesses are still very slow. And so this is how you can make functions that uh, would, and I think Scrypt and Bcrypt try to do this already, but we need more work on this, how to make functions that are slow on every machine, even on the most high-end machines, even on dedicated hardware, okay? On the other hand, I think this is just all desperate attempts, right? It only solves one problem of passwords, namely the fact that you get the hashed value stolen and you can't recover the password. There is also all the other problems. Passwords can be intercepted. Uh, passwords are predictable, people choose or share passwords, all these things are not solved. So I, I don't think you should see this message as saying, oh, we can save passwords. No, passwords are bad. We should get rid of them, but it's so hard to get rid of them because they're so cheap and it's so easy to integrate. So this is one way in which you can cover some problems, but still they stay bad and if you can get rid of them, it's better. So but we try to work on, on this approach. There is some cryptographic ideas to avoid this problem of the fact that our memory doesn't grow, but computers get faster. And by increasing X, you can actually take this element into account. But again, passwords can be intercepted. Passwords are badly chosen. So I'm not advocating passwords as a secure solution. Okay? So there is easy ways to increase our memory, namely store the password on a Mac stripe or on a USB stick, or on any device, then you can store keys of hundreds or thousands of bits. Okay, you no longer have memory constraints. You could even on a USB stick now store thousands of passwords and have one-time passwords used many times. And so every time read the next field, um, more or less the analogy of something what like one-time passwords used by the German banks where they print out some passwords forever and then you cross them out. So this works because you no longer require the user to memorize the password. But of course, if now the user loses the card or the USB stick, then you lost. So you, in fact, you also lost the advantage. You no longer identify the user, you identify the device or the, the, the bearer of the password, okay? 
There is another simple improvement, which is produce what we call a static certificate. Okay, I'll show it on the next slide. You just have a username, a serial number, a validity period, and then a vocation list. We'll come back to this. And what you do is you sign this with the private key of the CA or of the server and say, this user is actually a user in our system. For example, this user has the right to download the electronic version of the newspaper or to download songs in our system or videos for the rest of the year. Okay, it's just like a membership card of a library. It's signed by authority and you can check with the public key of the authority. You can check what this statement is correct. Okay, it's very simple and you can store this on any hard drive, on any smart card, on any memory chip. You can store this and every time when you want to give access, you check whether this signature is correct. Okay? This is known as static data authentication. It's actually implemented and standardized by EMV. EMV is European MasterCard and Visa. This is the standard for credit card security. I guess most of you have credit cards with chips these days. And so EMV, in the UK at least, implements this variant. It's highly insecure, but this is what they chose to implement because it was cheaper. Okay, so what is now nice is when you check the certificate, you only need the public key of the CA. So Bob no longer needs any secrets. It just needs the public key of the CA. Okay, so this is a very nice improvement. And you know for sure that only the CA can sign these certificates. So nobody can introduce false users in the system. Only CA can decide who enters, which usernames are allowed in the system or which accounts are active. What is the problem with this? Of course, there is no liveliness. You can still copy this. You can have this string which gives you access and you can copy it anywhere. Okay? So this thing is not, it doesn't protect you against sharing it with other people. If you have a subscription to a newspaper, you could give it to all your friends and they could also read the newspaper. So why did EMV use this or why did the British bank chose it? Because the smart cards to do this were about one euro cheaper. Also the terminals were cheaper if they only had to verify the signature. Okay? So this is why in the UK it was chosen to do this thing. Even if they knew very well, they were warned that what users would do was they would actually read out this string and copy it into other cards. By the way, also electronic passports use this technique. So they also have better protocols, but the early versions, the cheap versions of electronic passports, where you as a user pay 80 euros, they have this kind of crappy protection. And so you can, in principle, take this file from one passport and write it into another passport. Okay. A third application is the Belgian electronic purse Proton. Any users of Proton here? Oh, we still have a few. So they actually have this string as well. And for Proton, this is very important because this string prevents you from creating new cards with a positive balance. So you can, in Proton, if you hack the system, you can actually steal money, but they will catch you eventually because they can notice centrally that on this particular card number, more money was spent than it was put on the card. But you can never create new card numbers with, say, 100 euro because you can't sign this statement. So they know that every card with a number recognized has passed to the hands of um, the operator. So it actually, it achieves some protection, but it's not perfect. So if you want to do better, you need challenge response. This dates back to World War II, identification of planes. So essentially, you get a random question being sent. It assumed that Alice and Bob share a secret key which can be stored in a device like this, or typically is more stored in a smart card, where hopefully it's more secure. And what your card will do to prove who it is, is compute a Mac on this challenge. This is known as challenge response, and this is way better, because now you really get liveliness. Why? Because tomorrow you get a new challenge and there is a new response. So if you record the interaction, you cannot reuse it next time. Because if R is chosen properly, it's a counter, or if it's a random number from a sufficiently large range, it will never repeat. And so having old sessions will never help you to impersonate new sessions. So this really detects liveliness. So you're sure that Alice must be there at this time because you get a new question and a new answer. So it solves most of the problems with passwords, except this one problem that you have this database of keys here, and if somebody hacks this database, then there is a big, big problem. 
Is the system used? Anybody has used the system? TSM uses this. To authenticate your TSM phone, in your SIM card you have a key, the operator sends a random number and you, your phone sends back, or your SIM card sends back to the phone this Mac, and this is checked um, at the operator. This is how you authenticate as a GSM user, and this is how your operator knows who will pay the bill for your phone call. Okay, so you've using, been using the mechanism uh, on a daily basis without knowing it. Okay? Anybody uses VASCO or Secure ID tokens of RSA? A few people. So what you do there is you have a token displaying all the time, say every half minute or minute, a new challenge or a new response, excuse me. So what, what the trick there is that the challenge is not sent because the challenge is the time. So your device has a clock and every 30 seconds it updates the time and so it produces a Mac on the time. And this avoids the pre first pass where, the, where you have a challenge and you can just send a response right away. So it assumes you log in the in once every time period. So you have to be careful that you don't have multiple servers and somebody can quickly pick your login sequence and use it on another server. So you have to be careful with that. Um, there is other problems. What if you travel to a cold place and the clock slows down, then you're out of sync. There is many patterns on how to resynchronize. You can of course have this one readjust and find out where you are. There is also tricks where if there is a, a synchronization problem, a challenge is sent, as an exception, you type in the challenge and this challenge automatically adjusts the clock. But all these things have been patented. But there is very clever ideas on how to uh, minimize interaction and synchronize the two clocks. Could you set the time along with the Mac? You could do that too, yes. That would be, but very often you want to avoid this because, as you see, you don't want to couple this to a computer. So one of the big values of these tokens is that they're not logged in or not connected to a computer, so there is no viruses that can travel across the wire. And of course, users don't want to type much. So this would be another idea to do this, but of course, then we have to type more. But these, these people, these companies seem to make lots of money. You also may know that uh, what happened to RSA was that, so they have this key stored somewhere. Of course, they don't have a key for every user. They have a master key, and they encrypt the user identity with the master key to get the user key. And so this master key was actually stolen at RSA. So somebody sent, this a couple of years ago, Somebody sent an Excel file with vacation planning in the title or the subject to an employee. This Excel file contained an exploit. With this exploit, they then got a privilege. Privileges increased, and in the end, they got the master key. Amazing that those things are in a not protected system. And so this was noted because later on, Lockheed Martin got attacked um, actually using this master key. And so they had to give new tokens to everybody. And it's amazing that RSA is still in business, right, after undergoing such an attack. But it seems you can get away with a lot in the industry, right? You don't have to be secure, you just have to sell security. If something happens, you say, this is terrible, the attackers got so bad, but we'll compensate you and please buy more of our systems. And this seems to work. Okay, this one I'll skip. So assume now you have a more powerful device because the Mac attack, or the Mac approach, excuse me, assumes that you have a device with computational power, okay? So if you have more computational power, you can do public key operations. To give you an idea, public key operations are about 100 times more expensive than a symmetric key, than an AES or a secure ID token. So typically you need um, 10 to 100 times more hardware. Um, RSA keys tend to be now 2,000 bits to 4,000 bits. Elliptic curve keys 200 to 500 bits, while symmetric keys can be 100 or 200 bits. So you have much more uh, key bits necessary and also much more computational power or energy so you also need a better battery or a better power supply. Also signatures are longer. The shortest signature scheme I know is about 80 bytes so you cannot expect that the user copies this from a screen and types it in. So in fact I should change the picture in the sense that this device needs a connection to the computer and needs to send the signature. So what happens is the same thing, a random number is being sent but now Alice doesn't compute the Mac Alice signs this random value. This makes a very big difference because it can now be checked with Bob's public key. So with Alice's public key. So we've now solved all the problems. So remember when we looked at passwords, what all the problems were? The problem was that passwords were easy to guess. Well, a symmetric 
oh, sorry, a, a secret key for RSA is not easy to guess. It's a 4,000 bit key. Okay? So, you can in intercept the line and find out a secret. Well, no secret is ever being sent. The only thing which you send is a challenge and a response. And every time there will be a new challenge and a new response. So intercepting the line will not help you to impersonate in the future. Okay. Bob does not know Alice's secret key. He only knows a public key. So even if you hack Bob, you will not find anything useful. And so, in fact, all the problems of passwords have been solved. You pay a price for this. So, as I said, you have to have more computational power in this device. Um, the first public key smart cards came on the market around 94. And they were still expensive, so I think we only saw them on a, on a larger scale in the late 90s. Today, they're kind of common. All the EMV cards are public key. All those things are public key smart cards. Your identity card, if you're a Belgian or um, many other countries in Europe have identity cards which have public key technology on them. So they're no longer very expensive. I think it's more like one euro, one and a half euro uh, for the hardware. It's not that expensive to do this. But of course the problem is that you cannot have the user type in the signature because this is too long. So you have to connect this smart card with a card reader to the computer and it has to send the smart card, or the signature over this line. And so you have to hope that the smart card authenticates to the correct process. Could you hash it to some sort of? No, you cannot hash a signature. Well, you could do this, but then it can be forged easier. So the, and the problem is it can't be verified then at that stage, because the problem is that Bob cannot recompute this signature. Only Alice has the private key and can compute this signature. If you would hash this, well, Bob has no way to ever check this, because he can't recompute it and hash it himself, right? Or if you send, you could say, I don't send the last five bytes, and Bob guesses those. This you could do, but you need at least everything modulo five bytes. So if there was a solution to this problem, I think you could become rich if you find a solution to this problem. Okay? Now, it turns out that we can do better. I mean, it gets quite technical, but it turns out that in the previous scheme, you, you actually intuitively feel it's secure. But to prove mathematically that it's secure, you can actually not show that maybe by asking clever questions, Bob learns information on this key. Okay? So there is no attack, but there is also no proof that everything is really secure. And so in the 80s, um, Mitchell in 1984, they got the Turing Prize for this last year. Um, they actually invented zero knowledge. And zero knowledge is a technique which allows you to prove something without showing it. So you can, for example, prove that you have a graph, that you know in this graph a path from A to B without ever showing the path. So if you know the Where's Waldo pictures, you know those things? If you have kids, you know those things. Big pictures where there is somewhere a figure in there. Well, you can actually prove in zero knowledge that you know where Waldo is if you make a, a wide thing with a small hole and then you hold it in front so you see Waldo is here, but you don't prove where it is. And this trick, um, has been invented and it turns out to be very useful for authentication. And I'm not going to go into the math, but essentially there is one step extra. You have a commitment from Alice to Bob, then there is a challenge, and then there is a response. And by having this three-step interaction, it's called a Sigma protocol, what you can do is you can actually now mathematically prove that Bob learns nothing, except that he's sure he talked to Alice, but he can't even convince anybody else. And this avoids certain attacks. Now, the banks don't like this very much, because the bank, if a banker or a machine sees Alice, they want to actually have a proof that they've sold Alice. With zero knowledge, in fact, on the one hand, you can prove that nothing leaks about the secret, but Bob actually is he's sure he saw Alice, but he can't prove anybody else he saw Alice. So it's kind of a weird property. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I just want to point out it's very, very important. If you do auctions, like I mentioned this morning, you replace eBay, or you do voting in cryptography, or you want to have certain security, um, if you want public encryption secure against choice in ciphertext, you need zero knowledge. So it's a very important building block in crypto that you can say, um, I have something in an envelope which is locked. I can prove statements about it without ever showing you what it is. It's a very powerful primitive. 
way beyond authentication. By the way, this scheme um, has been implemented um, not because it was so secure, but because it was more efficient than the previous scheme. It was implemented by uh, NDS, a pay TV company, and was sold to Kamal Plus in the 80s. In fact, it was cheaper than public key crypto. This is why it became popular. There's also a very funny story behind this. If you go back to the paper, in the paper, one special case was forgotten in the proof. Okay? And so Canal Plus has this patented protocol. They bring out a million chip cards. And what happens, in fact, there is here the hackers. They send a commitment of zero, which was not covered in the proof. And then you got a challenge, and the answer was always zero, independent of the key. Of course, it's very easy to fix the proof and to exclude the added tests here that, in fact, you should not be accept zero as a challenge, or as a, as a commitment, sorry. But it turns out that it was impossible to fix all the smart cards, so they had to revoke all the smart cards and start over. So, but what is the message? Even a very small problem somewhere, an overlooked case in a proof, actually can lead to a major flaw in a product. It doesn't mean that the protocol is insecure, it was just the small detail was overlooked, and if you have adhere a check for non-zero, then the protocol is secure. Okay, I'll skip the details, but this is more or less a summary of what um, we've seen so far. So you have the four criteria here. Can the secret of Alice be guessed? Okay, and this is okay for everything except for passwords. What happens if you eavesdrop the channel? So can you prove that Alice is live? And this is okay except for all kinds of devices where you have fixed string being sent, either a password or a max stripe with a secret password or the signature, the, the case where you put a step, what they call step data authentication. Then, can Bob impersonate Alice? This is the only case where you can prevent this if you use public key. And ideally, you should use zero knowledge for this. And if the techniques that don't need secret info for Bob, secret information for Bob is the case where you have a static signature made with a, public, with a private key, you can verify with a public key, and the public key case. So depending on the price you want to pay, so password is the cheapest, smart card with public key is the most expensive, you can have one of or more pluses in places where you want. Okay, so but you see that there is, we can do way better than passwords, but of course it comes at the cost, you need extra devices and extra complexity. So a simple idea, we'll come back to it later, is the following. Because in practice, of course, if you don't want to store a key, you could actually derive the key from, by hashing a password or using a password as the key. Okay? So, because in many cases you can't store a key securely, so what you ask the user is enter your password and then this is used as a key in a Mac. Is this very secure? Well, it's not because an opponent can just look at the random number and the answer and then run through all the passwords until he finds the one that's correct. So in some sense, this is not a secure thing. Don't do this, okay? But we'll see later a better implementation of this idea. So this is for the case where you cannot store um, a secret somehow in for long term. So, authentication in practice is much harder. Because so far, I only discussed the problem of how does Bob know he's talking to Alice? But in practice, you also need the other problem. How does Alice know she's talking to Bob? And we have overlooked this, and this is what led to phishing. What does phishing mean? It means that somebody claims to be the bank, and the user happily logs in with username and password, and the hacker says, thank you, seals the username and password, and then does transactions on the real account with the real bank. Okay, so in fact, for most applications, you need mutual authentication, not natural authentication. Okay? And it's very hard for a user to check where he is or where she is. Authenticating a website is a hard problem. How do, how do you know this for sure? We'll come back to this tomorrow, but it's actually not so easy as you think it is. And for example, I don't know whether you heard about this, but if you go to secure websites, what, will, what happens is what NSA calls quantum insertion they will answer before the real website, and you will think that you're at the real website, but in fact you're at the NSA site, and this site will serve malware on your machine. So these things are happening in real life. Okay, so 
Authenticating a website is not so easy as you think it is. We all share passwords. We know it's forbidden, but we do it anyway. And so to prevent this, you can use biometrics because it's a bit harder to share your fingerprints or your eyes. Okay, this is an advantage of biometrics. We'll come back to this. Uh, there is other problems. I will come back to them, which are they're more protocol related, but we first discuss biometrics, then we'll come back to the other points. Okay, so biometrics. So phishing I discussed already. Okay, then something else about the two-stage authentication, and then we'll move to biometrics. So we've seen that if we want secure authentication, we actually need devices because our brains can't remember long keys. With our brain, we can't compute signatures or Macs. We're incapable of doing this. We can't do RSA computations. It's too hard for us. We can't do AES encryptions with our brains. It's too hard. So we have a device for this. But that means that you don't authenticate the user, you authenticate the device. So very often, you have a two-step authentication. Think of a credit card payment. You first enter the PIN. This PIN is checked on the card. And this authenticates the user to the card. And then the card authenticates the transaction to the terminal. Okay, so you have this two-stage thing uh, where you have first a local authentication, which is using a PIN code, and then typically with a limited number of trials allowed. And then you do the large authentication to the terminal, which is harder to control. And so you have, this is more secure because you use now the crypto in the card. So this is very often a trick. And so attackers, and I'll show you an example of this, try to go in the middle of those two things. So you have to be sure that those two things, authentication of the user to the card and the capital terminal are actually linked. And several protocols have this problem that they overlook the fact that these are two protocols that need to be tied together. Okay, so now back to biometrics. So in biometrics, this is what we've been sold as a solution for all our problems. The biometrics industry is very good at selling. They're very bad at security analysis. They, don't do, they only do testing very often in very small scale. I, I was asked to comment yesterday by the, the radio. I said that it, it was not a very interesting study. There were some researchers who published a study on bod body odor. They could recognize people based on their body odor. And this is an idea which is already more than 10 years old. And then they had new tests, which were very promising. And, and I was, it was the press release test, we did very promising ideas. We're going to apply this on a large scale soon. And you looked at the real experiment. They did tests with 13 users. And their accuracy was um, 85%, which meant that one in seven times it went wrong. So you know that if you scale this to 100,000 users, that it's not going to work anymore, okay? This is, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand this. But it's typical for biometrics, a lot of marketing. Um, we also have to look at three cases. Um, the first case is the easiest case. You show up at the border with a passport or an identity card, and you want to use biometrics to determine, is this Alice? Okay, so there is a claimed name. Do you have to, is this really Alice or not? The second problem is slightly different, is the Department of Homeland Security problem. They have a watch list of 100,000 people. You show up in the airport. Are you on the watch list or not? It's a very different problem. It's a lot harder, okay? And a false positive there is a big problem. Even if they have 1% false positives, they have a major problem because say there is a couple of million people in US airports every day. If 1% of those trigger an alert and the security condition have to be uh, kept in a secure room and so on, this is 10,000 of people um, to, which just happens every day. So it doesn't work very well. The third problem is similar to the, the first one, uh, the, the second one, but slightly different. Has this person ever registered in the system? So this is in particular a problem in countries like um, in the Middle East where they have um, immigrant workers and to prevent integration, they send them home after a few years and they tell them you can never come back. Okay, and then every time people enter, they check whether you're already in the database. Um, and I know the person who sold them the system says, our system works perfectly because we never detected anybody coming back. Okay, you, this is just, I mean, people in biometrics, they actually tell real nonsense, and, but they can keep a straight face. I can't, but they can do this and they become very rich. It's why I say a poor professor, right? I mean, because I can't tell you nonsense and keeping a straight face. It's too bad. Okay, so any part of our body we can use. So the, the, sorry for the Dutch, but so odor is kind of the newest hype. It, it was a hype ten, 10 years ago. It became a new hype. Um, it may work in the end. Um, you, you don't know. 
So all the things of our body are being used. Um, of course, what will be the ultimate thing will be DNA. That's the only thing that's really going to be reliable. I think next to that, uh, retina is actually, seems to be quite good, but you have to be very close to the sensor, and people don't like to look in lasers. I don't know why, but they don't like this. Okay. So how does this work? The question or? What? Yes. Yes. Well, if you look at the two use cases I see most, yeah, so it's most at borders or ATM machines, where there is, especially at borders, with somebody watching. I mean, you have to be really brave to start cheating a sensor and getting your plastic finger out in front of this guy in the US. I mean, I wouldn't do this, okay? This is you. So, also, to log in on your own machine, I, my previous laptop, I had a biometric sensor. I'm not going to cheat myself, right? It was not very secure, by the way, because I registered with one finger and I could log in with two fingers. It says you're not about security, right? It means essentially every 10 person can get in as well. So, but of course, in uncontrolled circumstances, um, it's, it's going to be problematic. And all these things can be spoofed. We'll, we'll speak about it. So, but there is many possibilities. The only things which are slightly more secure are DNA and I would say maybe retina scan. The Irish people, they make tremendous claims, but I'm not sure they can be backed up. So you always need the registration phase where you extract the, the face or the eye or the fingerprint, and then you extract the features, you store it in the template, and then later on there is the matching phase where you show up in front of the sensor, the features are extracted, matched in the database, and then you get a yes or no. Okay. For a cryptographer, this is paradise. There is all these places where you can attack this. You can hack the database, you find all the templates. They claim that you cannot go back from fingerprint templates to fingerprints, but I've never seen a mathematical proof of this. You probably can, just a bit of work. You can actually put fake lenses. You put on lenses, or you put a plastic finger on top of your finger, and you spoof the sensor. Maybe you can replace a signal here. In the end, this, this, this matcher says yes or no. What if you can attack this device and make it say yes all the time? And this is just paradise for hackers, but biometric devices, they're never made for hacking, they're made for selling. You just sell them and you say, this is fantastic, it will solve all your problems and please stop thinking. This is more or less what happens all the time. Yes? I was wondering, what, what about re revocation? You only have 10 fingers. Yes, that's a very big problem. Uh, for fingers, apparently, the mafia knows how to change fingerprints. It seems to be painful and slow operation, but it can be done. But so, and the big problem is not if a government wants to use fingerprints, I guess it's hard to forbid them, but the problem is what if then the bank does the same, and what if the, the credit card company does the same, and a shop does the same, and then one of those template databases gets hacked, then everything becomes useless. That's the big problem. But we'll come back to this, it's a very good point. So, if you want to look at performance of these things, you have to look at false accept and false reject. False accept means, what is the probability? You always set the threshold, so you measure how good the biometrics matches the template, and if you put this threshold higher, you will be better and better that you have a lower false accept, you will accept less intruders, but then your false reject goes up, and in fact, the real user will be rejected more and more. Now, if you look at what, what very often is chosen is equal error rate. It depends a bit on the application, as we will see later. Um, but if you look at most systems, so you have a trade-off. And I guess things like iris will be here. Things like fingerprint will be there. It's much worse. So of course, if you're going to do um, military access to nuclear weapons, you probably want to be here. You rather risk a false um, reject than having one false accept, because if somebody can fire a nuclear rocket, rocket, I mean, you have a big problem. Well, for civilian applications, you probably want to be more here at an equal error rate. Now, what is so funny is, what is this error rate? What's your guess? Take fingerprint. What is the error rate of a fingerprint? Equal error rate. 1 percent, 2 percent, 3 percent. Yes, that's what, a few percent. You know what this is? This is a password of one or two characters. It's a six-bit key, but it's secure because they tell you it's secure. 
If they keep you enough telling you that it's secure, then they tell you it's secure. So this is the reason why if you enter the US, you have to give 10 fingerprints. Because one fingerprint is only a six bit key or a five bit key. And first they collected two fingerprints and after a while they started collecting 10 because one fingerprint is not good enough. And even 10 is probably not good enough. Okay, so then people say, oh, we have to do multimodal biometrics, face and fingerprint. But if you do the math, okay, it's a good exercise for you to do the math. If you use face and fingerprint, either false accept will go up or false reject will go up, but you can't get better than 1%. Think about it. 1% is 1%, and this is a six-bit key. That's all you can get out of this. But don't say this aloud because politicians all want to buy biometric systems, and they want to spend millions on this. Okay? So fingerprints are nice because they're well studied. There is large databases. There is research papers of them. Um, so they're the best understood. They have small sensors, cheap sensors, small templates. You can buy them. Unfortunately, you can also hack them. So a cryptographer, this is a Japanese professor in 2001. He was bored in the weekend and he was working in the kitchen. And he used the material to make gummy bears to make a gummy finger. Um, and the whole biometrics industry was shocked. Because in a few hours he was able to make a gummy finger with which he could cheat at that time 80% of the fingerprint sensors. Okay? So today you have Dutch hackers who can come in this room, pick up fingerprints from the table and make in front of your eyes in a few minutes a fake finger. Okay? Of course we have solutions for this. Um, what you now have in the most expensive fingerprint readers is liveliness detection. So they check the temperature of the skin. It's enough to put a nine volt battery over a dead finger. You also get the same feature. So then the most, the even more expensive sensor, uh, sensors, they actually detect the heart pulse. You require $1 electronics to make actually a heart pulse in, the in, in a dead finger. It's not so hard, you know, it's changing voltage. So those things are only there for the show. If you look at real attacks, they never are secure, okay? So hand geometry was used by the Olympics in Atlanta. I think it's probably even more, even less secure than fingerprints. Voice, um, I guess it's nice because it's less intrusive. It may work in the home, but it doesn't work if you have a cold. Iris scan, this is the guy who claims that he never found somebody who came back and that the system is perfectly secure. He claims that the key is thousands of bits. The German government has analyzed the system and thinks it's more something like 20 or 30 bits. So they disagree. Um, and so people don't like to look in these lasers. Also, they can be spoofed by lenses. So they have also people who, the retina, this is the people who look inside this. This is harder to spoof, uh, but it's also more intrusive and the sensors are much, you have to come much closer to the sensor. So this is harder technology. So they use the blood vessel here, but probably people will make special lenses that can fake this too. Um, I'm gonna skip all those. Face is getting better. And I can tell you one secret, the Googles and the Facebooks are trying to hide for you how good they are. So five years ago, it was very hard on the bad lighting conditions to recognize anybody. I think they've made tremendous progress with this. There is one experiment uh, done by a friend of ours, Alessandro Acquisti in CMU, and he bought some commercial software, which is very expensive, I think about $10,000. He used his software on a camera in the hallway of his university and he tried to recognize students. So he filmed the students and he tried to recognize them. He could recognize them on Facebook. <coughs> it worked with a very high accuracy rate. So you can be sure that the Googles and the Facebooks and also the NSAs and their friends with public cameras, they can recognize you and find you in Facebook, LinkedIn, wherever you put your photo. But I think they're very scared about advertising how good it is because we, they're worried we'll all start wearing masks again. Apparently in all societies, the more important you were, the larger the part of your face you could hide. Maybe go back to this stage. We all walk around with masks because the only way to have any protection, because if not, you can actually be spotted based on your face and linked to all your online data. This you can look at offline. So what you, this is a comparison of the features of all these things. I think what is good to notice is that you never get green. So either the things are convenient to use, but then they're not very secure, or if they're secure, they're very inconvenient to use and they're quite intrusive. So wrap up, biometrics is very good because you identify the real person. So you can't give 
your biometrics to your secretary while you're traveling. They can be user-friendly. Users don't have to memorize anything. They can just use their face. It's very nice. Um, so you can't give it to anybody else, and you require less effort. There is many disadvantages. There is, of course, the privacy problem. Um, for example, many of our diseases we can have show up in our eyes. So if your company uses this, they can actually look closely at your eyes, or a country uses this, and can actually identify diseases uh, in a very intrusive way. What about liveliness? I discussed this already. So in Malaysia, they introduced a system of biometrics or fingerprints for identity cards and bank accounts. And what you get as a consequence is people with big knives walking around. Okay? And they cut off fingers because it brings in money. So then, of course, the next step is you put liveliness tests to detect dead fingers. There is two issues with this. There is 9-volt batteries, as I explained to you. And second, do the guys with the knives know about these detectors? If they don't, they keep cutting off fingers, right? Until it works again. So it's not so sure, it's so desirable for society that you have liveliness tests. These guys may be keeping cutting off fingers in the hope to be rich anyway. So when will they stop, right? It's, it's a very interesting sociological question. So you see that I don't want my money protected by a fingerprint at all. So you can't replace it, it's a point you made. It's very hard to replace, so only the mafia can do it. Um, you have the guys with the knives. It's not very hygienic to put your, I mean, if you go to US customs and, or immigration, you have to put your fingers on this thing. Which I mean, I think it's really, who else has put their fingers on there, right? I mean, I find it terrible. So some people, um, disabilities cannot register. Also, it turns out that um, Asian women don't have very discernible fingerprints. Some people have damaged riches, like wood choppers. They, in fact, they don't chop their fingers, but they damage the, they got too much uh, skin on their fingers and you can't see their fingerprints. And, and so the keys are only six bits or 10 bits for most technologies. Of course, once you have DNA, there I believe with DNA, of course, you can identify people uniquely. Okay, that's, that's a, a big problem. That, that's gonna work. But it's of course also extremely intrusive. So what we've been looking at in several projects with large, larger biometric players is, can we derive from biometrics a key in such a way that for every application, a new key is derived, and that even if one key leaks, you don't find back the biometrics. And the answer is, well, not quite. There were several schemes claiming to give this property, but we've broken many of them. But this is the idea that you have a single biometric and you derive multiple keys in such a way that the bank, um, the government, and maybe a shop can each use the same biometric but have a different key. Still, it doesn't solve our problems of many of the other problems, right? So I'm still a big biometric skeptic. So if you look at or listen to biometrics people, be very skeptical, please. They don't like attackers at all. And they do tests on 13 people and they claim that this will scale to a million, okay? And there is statistics how fingerprint scales from 100 people to 100,000 to a million, it, it looks very bad. Okay? So, we were discussing limitations of biometrics, sorry, lim limitations of authentication. And so, another problem is very obvious. At least if you go back to my student time in the 80s, there was a PDP-11 on the second floor in computer science. And if you wanted to work on the machines, you had to go to a terminal, put your code next in front of a terminal, then go upstairs and then you would have to take the cable of your terminal and find a free slot in the computer and plug it in. Okay, and then you could work on the machine. So they had more terminals than slots in the machine. So you could actually, you had to wait until there was a free slot. And the terminal was a dump terminal, you couldn't do anything on it. Right? It did, had, not, had no processing power, it could only display characters. So, of course, I never did this, but what could you do in principle if you were a bad guy, if there was no terminals, no slots free, so the professors had the front, the top row of slots. You could actually unplug a professor and plug in your terminal. I've, I never did this, but you could do this in principle, okay? And so it, at the moment you did this, you went downstairs, you were now the professor. Because you just took over his session and he was humming on the keyboard and seeing nothing. He said, must be something wrong, this machine is rebooting. But you actually were the professor. And the same thing can be done over the network. No matter how secure your authentication is, whatever clever super duper protocol you use, if somebody cuts off the connection here and takes over, 
your authentication has become useless. Right? You can do anything you want here. If somebody takes over, jumps your connection, and uses your IP address and takes over the stuff or plugs the wire in, this person is you. What's the solution for this? Yes? Yes, so what the solution is, authenticated key agreement. During authentication, you agree on a key, and you use this key to authenticate and encrypt this whole session. And so the intruder doesn't know this key, and so he will not be able to continue. That's what you do. You derive a key in the beginning, and with this key, you protect all the rest of your session, and this means that the communication is now tied to the login phase. Okay? There is more problems, and this is, looks like uh, I'm dealing with warfare. It's just a fancy example from warfare, but um, it's actually really happened. But in fact, it also happens with terminals and with credit cards. It's known as the mafia fraud. And you can think for yourself how the mafia can use this, but I'll give the example of the war between South Africa and Namibia. So South Africa has all the modern equipment. As you see, this is a South African aircraft. This is an anti-aircraft missile. And then this is Namibia with their planes from World War II and their crappy missiles. And so the idea is that if your plane crosses the border, you shoot it, okay? Now there is a big question is how do you know it's your plane or it's a plane of the enemy? And for this in World War II, IF, IFF was invented, Identification Friend of Foe, Challenge Response Protocols. So you have a transponder in your plane with a secret key. You ask it a question. Okay, and then you get the right answer, and if the answer is correct, you don't shoot it. If the answer is wrong, you shoot the plane. Being a pilot is dangerous for the military. That's why they paid very well, okay? And the Namibians with their slow planes, they had no chance, right? I mean, they go to the border, they get a challenge, they don't know the answer. So what did they do? They follow, forwarded the challenge to their own ground station. The station would find a nearby South African plane, and asked the same question. This plane was afraid of getting shot, so it actually gave the right answer, which was then forwarded to the Namibian plane, who then gave the answer to the South African defenses, and they flew through. Okay? So, if something similar is happening with the Mafia, the Mafia sets up shops where they sell newspapers or cigarettes, and you come with your credit card, and you think you're paying for your cigarettes, but in fact you get your cigarettes for free, and instead you're paying for diamonds, which an accomplice of the Mafia is buying in the shop a few streets further. And this attack has been demonstrated in real time. It works. It's very hard to detect. And the only way to detect this is to prove that the other person is nearby. But this is very hard because, as you know, automatic waves travel very fast, speed of light. So even if you need a nanosecond, the light already has traveled 30 centimeters. So you have to be extremely fast to detect that somebody is close. And there is no cryptography that can help you. It's only speed that can help you. To be so fast that you detect the difference. And of course, with planes, you can argue that those things are kilometers, but in stores, those things can be actually 100 meters, and you'll never detect this. And so the smart card industry has no answer for this. Of course, they have mechanisms to detect the fraud if it happens at large scale, and so on, but in fact, there is no defense against it. And there is no cryptography that can defend you except for distance bounding protocols, but they're very hard to implement, in particular on a smart card. With a smart card, any command takes a few milliseconds. Okay, and a few milliseconds, you can calculate that's a few hundred meters or so. So it's very, very hard to detect this attack. So for this, we need distance bounding. The rest, I think, I discussed mostly already. So you need location to have secure location. It's actually essential for secure authentication. It's a new insight in the last 10 years, and we still don't have practical answers. I can't say buy this module and now you're secure. So some vendors have implemented solutions, but they kind of work. They don't really work. This we discussed already. So the final example, maybe Stephen will discuss in more detail uh, when he discusses payment systems. So Stephen Murdoch is the author of this attack. But essentially, if you go make a payment with your credit card, what happens is that you enter the PIN in the terminal, and then the PIN is sent to the card, and then the card says the PIN is correct. 
okay, if you use one of those cards. So what they found out, in fact, is that you can come with a stolen card, for which you don't know the pin, and then you enter any pin you want. The pin is sent to the card, and then you just always send yes. And that's it. So in fact, you make a card, or you put a device here that actually intercepts the answer with the card, even never gets to see a pin. But you always send the 9000 command, which means the pin was correct. So this is an example of two protocols which are kind of interconnected in the wrong way. So this protocol, the pin check, should be connected to the, next, the rest of a transaction. So in the rest of a transaction, the card should indicate that it has checked the pin. But in fact, in EMV, it didn't happen in all applications or all options of EMV. And so you could actually put any card there and spoof the pin check. What you just do is you have a smart card and you have to put a very small wire on it. It has been, they've, they've done it, it's shown on, on BBC TV. Maybe um, Stephen will show you the videos. You can't see it. They have a small wire, they put the card in the thing and the wire lobe rocks in, 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 into their sleeve and in the pocket there's a device that does the impersonation. Also the mafia fraud is done the same way. You don't see it. You, you have to watch the videos. And If the pin is checked online, then this attack doesn't work. But the idea of EMV is to have an offline check in many cases. I think this is a problem of trust. Maybe uh, in a Spanish ID card, uh, when you talk with the, with the chief, you have to establish a SSL um, communication. So you can check if your yes. card has a, a trusted uh, but there is the similar, I mean, I don't know the Spanish protocol, but we've looked at many solutions in Belgium. My bold statement is that no matter what you do, if you don't have a trusted smart card with a display, you can always fool a card. So you need a certificate? No, so I think the problem is fundamental. A card doesn't have an interface. So you as a user, you don't know who's talking to the card. Maybe your computer can say, I'm talking to your card. But how do you know? Your computer may be lying to you, maybe owned by NSA. So the only way you can talk to a smart card securely is when you have a card reader, which you know is trusted and has a display. And at least you know what it says to the card. Any setup where you don't have your own card reader, with, which is trusted with a display, your card can be secure, but it, you don't know what it does. There are, there are, um, uh, but this is a more subtle attack. This is an attack which goes in between two protocols, more or less. The protocol which authenticates the user to the card, and then the card to the terminal. And so the, the fix for this attack is that the card should sign that the pin has been checked in the next step. But, but a secure sign device? Sorry? A secure sign device. Yes. Uh, That's a big misunderstanding. A secure signature device is a smart card. How do you know what a smart card is signing? How do you know that? Somebody sends bytes to it. Are you going to inspect them personally? No, you send them using your machine. But you can't trust your machine. Okay? If you could trust your machine, your machine could sign for you. Right? EPA is a trusted platform. Yes. But we can have a whole lecture about that, how you can put 17 ways to break TPMs. And, and so the problem is, anyway, if you could trust your machine, you, could, you don't need a smart card. You could sign on your machine, right? So you sign on the machine. You sign on a smart card because you don't trust your machine. Do you agree to that? But then how do you know what gets to the smart card? Because it's your machine sends something to the smart card. So in fact, many people believe that smart cards solve problems, but they only create new problems. They move problems and make them slightly easier. And one step, and some banks are now moved to this step. I know at least one bank we worked for. They now have actually assigned requests sent to the smart card reader. The smart card reader displays this request. And now the attacker has to spoof the smart card reader. But you always need a trusted display. Otherwise, there is no a secure transaction does not exist without a trusted display. That doesn't mean that we can't live without trusted displays because we're doing it right now. But if you really want security, you need a trusted display. And so far, we don't have it. Anybody has a trusted display? I'd like to see it because I still haven't seen one. It can be done, but we don't have it today. There was one, but only for text, text 
Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. But so a trusted display is very, very high problem to do it cheaply, right? So maybe in the future we'll have on our smartphones on the back a small screen which will do the transactions. That may be possible. I don't know. Okay, so if you want to read more about authentication, NIST has published some guidelines, although since NSA has been um, undermining NIST standards, you may not want to trust NIST anymore as much as you did before. But I'm, I'm, I have no indication that they actually undermine this document. So key establishment, how do you establish secret keys using secret keys? And then how do you establish secret keys using public keys? And then tomorrow we'll discuss how you establish public keys, which seems to be like a trivial problem, but as we'll see, I need an hour and a half to explain you, so it's probably not as trivial. <coughs> so cryptography is about moving problems to keys, and so in practice, this is where the real problems are. Right? Cryptography, the mathematics, is the easy part. The real hard part is how to manage the keys, because you deal with real, real users, users who forget their passwords, lose their keys, are sloppy, have their machines broken into. So this is where the real problems come. Okay, how to install keys and how to keep keys secure, how to refresh them and so on. So I explained to you the GSM protocol for challenge response, but in fact it doesn't work like this because this would be highly insecure because you would authenticate the user and then the hackers would take over and they would actually place a call after the authentication at your expense to Brazil. So to prevent this, GSM has a feature called encryption. So the R is also used as an input in A8, a secret algorithm sitting in your SIM card, and together with the user key, this produces the session key. Okay? And this precludes taking over the session or listening to the session, because only the SIM card and the phone have access to the session key, and only they can actually have a phone call. So by introducing a session key, you actually bind the authentication phase to the data exchange phase. And in 3G, it's even better. There, there is not only an encryption, but there is also a macking on every part of the text. Because in GSM, in fact, opponents can still modify bits of the message. And so if you get an SMS, you never know whether it's correct. This scheme does not prevent changing of data. It only prevents eavesdropping. Okay, so this is a scheme you've been using every day. So A8 is secret. Also the Mac, it's called A3, it's also secret. Okay, so a few more simple protocols. So Alice and Bob share a secret KAB and they want to generate a temporary secret session key K. Why do they want to do this? Well, this key may be very expensive to establish and you don't want to burn it, you don't want to use it too much, you want to use it only rarely because every time you use it, maybe you leak information to side channels or some other things. In the GSM case, your long-term key stays in the SIM card and your session key goes to the phone. But your operator doesn't trust the phone. It, does, it trusts the SIM card because your SIM card comes from the operator. So there is many reasons why you want to have session keys which are kind of used for massive data, and long-term keys, which are used only rarely to establish session keys. This is called the hierarchy of keys. So you have long-term keys and short-term keys, and short-term keys you want to refresh on a regular basis. So what happens is that Alice en generates a new session key. Together with the time and Bob's name, she encrypts this and sends this to Bob using their shared key. Bob can decrypt, can get the session key, can check the time and check his name, if he's happy, he will re-encrypt with this new key, the time, Alice's name, and the hello message. So now Alice and Bob know that they've established a session key. Okay? So, and they can use this key, say, for a transaction, or for an hour of communication, or for a phone call, and then they can throw out the key. So this is a very common approach. Now, what do we do? So afterwards, Alice and Bob share a key, and Alice and Bob also know that they talk to each other. One warning, if protocol people write E, they mean encryption, but what they really mean is authenticated encryption. So what they mean is the CCM mode or the GCM mode. But they don't say this to you, but that's what they really think when they're writing encryption. 
So what if Alice and Bob don't share a key? Well, then you hope that Alice and Bob share a key with a third party. And this is an example of Kerberos. Um, and then we speak of a key distribution center. So Alice shares a long-term secret with KDC called KA. Bob shares a long-term secret with KDC called KB. And so Alice says, hey, I want to talk to Bob and I don't have a key. KDC will say, okay, here is your key. I will make a key for you. I will encrypt it under your key and under Bob's key. Okay. So Alice can decrypt this first message and she gets the key. And the second part she will send to Bob. Okay. Bob can decrypt this, he gets a session key, and now he can say to Alice hello, and now Alice and Bob share a session key. Okay. By the way, never use this protocol, it's a toy example. I can break it in 17 ways. Okay. Don't ever use this protocol, it's just a principle. Okay. It's very difficult to make these protocols, and I'll show you some problems um, probably on Friday. Okay. So it's just the concept that you first share a key with a third party and suddenly you share a key with each other. Of course, the third party knows this key. So governments like this approach because it means they own all the key. They know all the keys in the system. So also in companies, if you want to control all communication, this is fine. Okay, so now I'll skip Kerberos um, and we'll discuss Diffie-Hellman. So in Diffie-Hellman, Alice and Bob share no secrets. They just have an open conversation. In fact, this happens more or less simplified when you go to Amazon or to google.com these days in a secure way. So you send, what you have as parameters is an alpha and also a prime number P, which I hide to hide the complexity. But so alpha and P are typically 2000 bits. So they're quite large integers. And so you choose a random number X and compute after the X mod P. And Bob does the same thing. He chooses a random number y and computes after the y mod p, and he sends also his value to Alice. So what else does Bob do? He takes what he got from Alice, alpha to the x, and he raises this to his secret power y, his secret y, and now he gets alpha to the xy. What does Alice do? Alice takes what she got from Bob, which is alpha to the y, and she raises it to her secret x and gets alpha to the y x. And you don't have to be a genius in math to see that Alice and Bob now have the same value alpha to the x y. Okay? And this is known as the Diffie-Hellman protocol and the Diffie-Hellman key. So this is kind of a miracle. And Diffie and Hellman got for this the Turing Award in the 90s. So it's one of the greatest inventions of computer science of the 20th century. So Alice and Bob have no secret information, they have an exchange, and similarly they share a secret key. So of course I have to answer the question, why is this key secret? Can Eve not compute this secret? Can you not compute from those two values this value? Well, let's try, can you multiply those two values? What do you get then? If you multiply after the x times after the y, what do you get then? After the x plus y, not after the x times y. Okay, so you, by multiplying those things, you can't do this. So, in fact, we believe as cryptographers that you cannot compute from those two values this value, but we can't prove this. So if mathematicians can't prove something, they make an assumption, and the assumption is called the Diffie-Hellman assumption. And the assumption says that you can't compute from those two values this value. Alpha is public, yes. It's used in standards. Alpha and also the prime number, they're completely public. But you cannot compute from those two values this value. Okay? So we can't prove this, we just assume this. And this is prayer theoretic. Every night the cryptographers pray that nobody can compute from those two values this value. We can't prove this is impossible. But we just hope it's the case. Okay? And so this is what you use if you're on the internet. Now, of course, if you could compute x from after the x, you would be easy to, you would easily break the system because if you could compute x from here, then you could do this calculation. You take this value and raise to the power x. Or if you could compute y from after the y, then you could compute this value here, the public value after the x times y, and you could compute it as well. So we implicitly assume that you cannot invert those functions because then it would be easy to solve. But in fact, we don't know whether there is any way to solve this problem. It's known as a Diffie-Hellman assumption. 
Okay. So I'll skip the more advanced parts. We'll come back to this on um, Friday. But there is a big problem. And this is, how does Alice know she's talking to Bob? And the answer is, she doesn't. She just now shares a key with a random stranger. And the same thing for Bob to Alice. So to solve this problem, we have a very simple solution. And this is Alice signs with her private key these two values. And similarly, Bob signs with his private key these two values. And now Bob can check that this alpha to the x came from Alice and that Alice got alpha to the y. And with this message, signed with Bob's private key, um, Alice knows that alpha to the y came from Bob and that her alpha to the x has arrived. So now Alice and Bob are tied to this. How do you check these signatures? With the public keys of Alice and Bob. So we assume that Alice and Bob know each other's public key. And so now they actually share a secret and they're sure the other party is there and active. And this is the most secure protocol we have to share data on the internet. So if you use SSL, you should use this protocol if possible. Also, if you use SSH, this protocol is being used well, without the signatures, but there is other tricks there. And in IPsec, you can also use this protocol. It's known as a station-to-station -station protocol. It's invented in 92 by Diffie, Hellman, and Van Oshot. So for example, in the internet, you find a protocol called Ike, and Ike is very similar to this. Um, they never call it station-to-station, -station, but it is station-to-station -station, with some small twists. There is some extra properties, but I will not discuss them now in detail. Why I want to discuss this? Because there is also another option, especially in TLS, in web security, you have the option to actually use RSA. And this is simpler because in this case, your browser generates a session key. It somehow got the public key of Bob of Amazon. I'll explain you tomorrow how. It encrypts with the public key of Bob the session key and sends this to Bob. Okay? And now Bob can decrypt using his private key. So Amazon decrypts it using private key and gets a session key. And from now on, Alice and Bob share a session key. Well, this kind of works as well. And it's simpler. If you look at station to station protocol, you can compute alpha to the x, alpha to the y, alpha to the x to the y, alpha to the y to the x. You need to assign the things and check the signatures. So in terms of public key operations, this is five times cheaper than um, the previous protocol. So this is the default option until recently in SSL TLS because it's more efficient. Well, there is some more problems, like this could be an old message. It could be a message of last year. And in fact, Bob doesn't know this key is coming from Alice. But in fact, on the internet in SSL, Amazon doesn't know it's you. And you later identify yourself by sending a password or by entering your credit card number or so. Okay? Now, Alice also doesn't know that Bob has actually received the key, but that's, again, a detail we'll, we can discuss later. So the first one problem you can solve is by adding a timestamp. Bob can check that this is a, a fresh key. That's easy. You just add a time, and Bob knows that this message was not very old. Um, and if you really want to make it more secure, which is not done on the web, you could also actually, Alice could sign this thing with her private key. Okay, then you really would have most of the properties which you want and still be cheaper than station to station. So this is my last point I want to make. So now you have the choice between this protocol, which is typically implemented using RSA. Well, in fact, it's more this protocol, but okay. Or station to station, which is Diffie-Hellman and then signatures. So why is my advice, don't use this protocol? Okay, it's a very subtle point. So what happens in this case if the NSA hacks your server and finds your private key? NSA can do other things. They can send you a security letter, which means it's an order by the government. It says, give us your secret key, and you can't tell anybody you did. If that happens, then NSA finds now the private key of Bob, and of course they can decrypt the session key, but NSA, remember, they store everything, so they can go back for years, and they can decrypt all past session keys and read all your communications now by this one key. Okay? 
Now, if you go from station to station, this is a bit harder to see, but if you think about it carefully, it's what you do here, what are the long-term keys here are the signing keys of Alice and Bob. Because X and Y, after the interaction, you throw them out. So if NSA comes in and gets a signing key, from then on they can be you, and they can impersonate users and claim that they are now Lavabit or somebody else, but they can never read past communications. If you were smart and you threw out all the X's and Y's and threw out all the session keys out, the only thing NSA finds is Diffie-Hellman values, and NSA cannot find from alpha to X and alpha to Y, they cannot compute alpha to X, Y, as far as we know. Yes, Jim? This is perfect. This is what cryptographers with a very bad name call forward secrecy or perfect forward secrecy. It's not perfect, but it's known as forward secrecy. It means that if you compromise in the future, it doesn't affect your past. Because if you compromise in the future, it always messes up your future. Somebody gets your key, it's like somebody having the front key of your house. You can live there. You can't do anything. But if you use RSA, you don't have forward secrecy, which means Compromising your key at some moment means that all your past communication is also exposed. So NSA loves that you use this key. Is there a more academic name for perfect forward security? No. no. That is well, some people go with backward break protection. But it's definitely not perfect because perfect usually refers to information theoretic security. And it's not information theoretic. So if, if NSA can break Diffie-Hellman, you're still cooked here. If NSA has a quantum computer and they can compute after the XY from after the X after the Y, it doesn't help. But this is the reason why Google got, got very angry at NSA and they switched last November, they switched RC4 to GCM mode and they switched from RSA to Diffie-Hellman in the TLS options. And some others hopefully are following suit. So this means that even if the server gets broken into and they get a security letter, your past communications are still secure. So it stops, of course, only one of the seven ways for NSA to get at your data, but at least it's one of the ways. And so it's worth paying the price and going for Diffie-Hellman. It's more expensive, it's more complex, but you also get something in exchange. That's the main message I wanted to give. So to wrap up, time to wrap up. So I'm not going to give you all the details, but just a concluding slide. This is always what happens here. Never mind. I'll come back to this on Friday, but protocols are very subtle. I showed you only a few protocols. If they look simple, but they're very, very hard. Okay? It has happened that protocols of three lines have existed for 15 years without problems, and suddenly somebody spots a problem. So making a secure protocol is very hard, and there is only one rule for protocol design. Don't, okay? Don't make your own crypto systems and don't make your own protocols. Most people understand that they can't make block ciphers. Well, I have bad news for you. You can't make protocols either, okay? You need a PhD for this. Four years of study, then you can make a protocol. Don't think you can invent something that works. Um, even today, every year we find new flaws in TLS. And this protocol is out there since 1994, okay? Even now, Dozens of smart research are looking at TLS and find new problems. So don't make something yourself because it will be broken in many ways you never could imagine, okay? So use the standards and try to avoid using too many options. Try to simplify it. The simpler, the better. But never ever think of making your own protocols. That's one message. Second message, get rid of passwords. But if you keep using them, I showed you how to do it a bit better than normal by using this S-crypt or B-crypt, so the slow hashing. There is many good other technologies for authentication, but not biometrics. Biometrics has many limitations. And finally, for protocols, there is good solutions out there, and you can actually get OpenSSL, all the other libraries that implement them for you. And if there is bugs discovered, at least somebody will fix them. So don't make your own protocols, and don't write your own protocol code. Okay, but there is also good news. There are good solutions out there which you can use. Okay, time to stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. And at the end of the paper, I also put, of the slides, I put some recent papers with indication, very nice overviews that compare all possible alternatives to passwords. And so it's very rare, but academics write overview papers, but this is one done by my friend Paul Van Orschot. It's an excellent paper. I can recommend that you read it. Good. Thank you very much. <laughs>